Dear colleagues, it's time to start our last session our, of our workshop, and it's my pleasure to invite for talk uh, Tomaso Calarco. Uh, he is director of the Institute of Quantum Control of the Peter Grunberg Institute at Forschungs Centrum Zulich. And uh, not only director, but I think uh, uh, you all know him that he was, uh, he has authored in 2016 the Quantum Manifesto, which initiated the European Commission's Quantum Flagship Initiative and is currently the chairman of its Quantum Community Network. So please, Tomada. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Thanks a lot for having me here. Indeed, I am very pleased to be here, um, not only in terms, of course, of the scientific conversation, but also I understand uh, the sort of interest in the European initiative. And in fact, um, you might be aware that over the last few months, um, we have with the Quantum Community Network, which is one of the governance bodies of the flagship, um, we have decided to involve also representatives from Ukraine and so it is a great opportunity, it's very important also for me to be able to sort of speak in this context uh, in the hope that this will lead to further cooperation. In fact, the title of my uh, presentation is uh, a little bit strange because it's from control to cooperation but in terms of control refers to the scientific part of my research which I have been uh, asked to, to present and I'm very happy to do that in, uh, in the first part of my talk and then cooperation does not refer to cooperativity between at in atomic interactions for instance but it refers just to the cooperation that we established at European level with this initiative the quantum flagship and I'm going to illustrate a little bit the opportunities which are present and which will come in the future so <clears throat> let me start then with with my presentation and, uh, you know, uh, the first part about control and uh, the part which is re related to my research. So, <clears throat> indeed, as has been mentioned, um, I am at the Institute of Quantum Control in Jülich, and this is about uh, trying to perform some uh, difficult tasks uh, in the manipulation of quantum systems, which can be very relevant for the realization of quantum technologies. So, when we have a quantum system, which we want to, you know, um, uh, control in terms of evolution from an initial state Psi 0 and a final state Psi of T, um, then, well, it's like this, this game that I, I show there um, on, the, on the left, which is, you know, you have a few control knobs and you have many uh, degrees of freedom and you have to find the correct path and there are a lot of pitfalls in the sense that there are, you know, uh, the coherence channels um, which you want to avoid. But on the other hand, you know, it's worse than what is depicted here because here when we play this game, we can look at it. But of course, we cannot look at the quantum system. Otherwise, we will, of course, cause a collapse of the wave function. And also, there is a lot of noise, which is like playing this game, not just on your table, but on a truck running on an unpaved road at full speed, okay, shaking, shaking, shaking with the, with the balls flying in all directions, and also trying to control that, not with your hands, but just with the box gloves. So this is, you know, sort of the situation that we have, and still we want to prepare quantum states to perform quantum gates and to suppress the coherence. And so this is something which, you know, cannot just be done by hands, but, you know, the time dependence of these different controls is something which you can um, develop in terms of automatic controls. And this is the main point that we are trying to pursue in, with the activity in my institute. So, of course, for doing that, you have to use appropriate mathematical tools to get an optimal outcome. And this involves different ideas, including lately machine learning. But, of course, it starts with some uh, concept uh, uh, of, let's say, basic physics, if you wish, and uh, we developed this in, in, uh, in the context of what we call the chopped random basis algorithm, the CRAB algorithm, uh, which essentially has the purpose of taking a certain time dependence, here depicted as C0 of T for a certain 
function which will drive your system, uh, uh, updating it, improving it in terms of you know reaching with a better fidelity, with a lower error, the final goal that you uh, um, set to yourself. So how does our algorithm work? Well, essentially the crab, so our algorithm is coming and essentially um, expanding you know, whatever form you have for your function in on a set of basis functions, which are also, there is a stochastic component, they are also randomized in order to compensate and to uh, overcome possibly being stuck in local minima. And the important point is you are, you know, using different kinds of, of basis functions. It could be polynomials, it could be sinusoids, it could be um, different kinds of, of, of basis, Chebyshev basis, uh, Hermit polynomials, Gaussian functions, whatever you, you have. But the important point is you reduce the um, pulse shape and the update in the pulse shape in terms of just a few components. So this n, which is uh, in the sum, is reduced to, I don't know, a few order of 10 parameters. And having done that, essentially what this implies is that your problem is reduced to really a um, cost function, a fidelity or error function, which is uh, um, as a function of a few parameters. And now you can use, you know, you will start in a certain, with your initial guess pulse in a certain point in this landscape, and maybe you want to minimize uh, the error, minimize some cost function. And so you can do that using some minimization procedures, which do not necessarily require gradient, but you, you let this little polytope there roll down the hill until you get a pulse shape, which is really corresponding to some prescribed properties like some spectral properties, some you know characteristic times which are available in an experiment. And so uh, not only this, but you can do this without any prior knowledge of the system in the sense that it really works remotely. This is what we call a remote crab or red crab uh, in the sense that you have your experiment or your simulation running on your favorite computer or lab. And then we just install uh, a little client program which sort of communicates with the experiment for instance in terms of you know uh, giving a, a, a pulse a guess pulse to apply and then getting the figure of merit which the experiment measures and then it uh, iterates it with our server in which our algorithms are residing which then produce a new pulse which automatically improves the quality the figure of merit that you are trying to to achieve so <clears throat> here are some examples a few examples because you know uh, i have to cover a lot of things in this half an hour so i i would like just to give a couple examples of how it works in experiments that we developed uh, including remotely so here is an example of what is called the alice challenge this is uh, really a game a gamified quantum experiment in the sense that our colleague Jakob Scherson in Orkus, you know, um, made an experiment of cooling atoms to produce a BEC um, available via internet. And, you know, really real gamers, non-physicists, like regular people could access this and be able to sort of adjust the experimental parameters in order to get a high score. In this case, the score, the winner would be the person who achieves the highest number of um, uh, atoms in the final condensate and what we did is we wanted to compete with uh, these people in the sense that we wanted to test our algorithm working remotely using the same access interface so um, here is a little movie uh, in which you know it uh, gets explained to the to the gamers which are non-physicists the fact that you have a certain cup which is a magnetic nature you have a hot fluid which is your, your cloud of atoms you want to put it in a in, a, in an optical trap and then you want to lower the um, optical potential until the evaporation leads to you know a very cold ensemble of atoms and here is um, uh, you know the analog which you know the gamers were explained how you go into a mod and then you start you know with a dipole trap lowering the intensity of lasers in such a way that you want to end up with a um, with a condensate and here is really the interface which you know people could use in order to shape the time dependence of those lasers and of the magnetic field uh, sorry the RF field in order to achieve some uh, condensation and so you know thousands of people have played this game and we have competed against them why because well you say of course a computer can perform better than normal people but as a matter of fact before the crab algorithm actually you had um, gamers which managed to outperform in some cases the best 
um, optimal control algorithm which uh, were existing. Now, what we did here is indeed, um, as you can imagine, we got some improvement. It is kind of uh, uh, maybe 20% improvement over the best performance of, of um, humans in this, in this context. But the important point that we wanted to demonstrate, it is not such an interesting uh, physical problem because evaporative cooling and production of Bose-Einstein condensate is something which you know, is done routinely in many, many labs around the world. But we wanted to uh, probe the unique aspect of can we have it run from our server really remotely? And indeed it worked so that you know we can move on to other kinds of experiments, which I will illustrate in the next uh, few minutes, just a couple of them. So these are experiments in the context of um, uh, neutral atom quantum simulation in which we created the fat test and the fastest and the fastest Schrodinger cat uh, of human history, uh, at least to date, in the sense that we wanted to create entangled states. Um, now, first, an entangled state with the highest number, a GHZ state with the highest number of qubits involved. We reached the limit of 20 qubits. I will now illustrate how we did it. And then in a following experiment in a different context, um, we achieved the fastest entanglement between in the degrees of freedom of internal and external nature in an atom. So in this case, we are speaking about an experiment performed in the group of Michel Lukin at Harvard, where they manipulate with optical tweezers an array of Rydberg atoms, which they can put in an order structure with a filling one. And now you have the possibility to manipulate them with an external laser. And if you sweep the frequency, you change the detuning, as you can see in the diagram here, you have a phase diagram, which uh, uh, you know um, leads you from a, a phase in which you have all the atoms in the same state to, um, after the sweep, the ground state of the uh, on the opposite side of the transition, so to say, it is not an actual phase transition because it is at finite size, but still, it is a sort of uh, uh, indeed not in the thermodynamic limit, but uh, uh, approximately a quantum phase transition in which you leave you lead to uh, a state which, in this case, would be a GHZ state in the sense that it is. Uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, plus 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And so this is a GHZ state, and you can achieve it via this sweep, and you could do it adiabatically, but if the adiabatic time, if you increase the number of atoms, becomes increasingly large, and so there is decoherence because there is also decay from the Rydberg state, and so you are not able to achieve that. So what we did was to use our uh, CRAB algorithm uh, in order to optimize, you see here in the lower left, the pulse shapes, um, for the rabbi frequency and the detuning which we applied and we got you know a final state in which was uh, population only in the two components of the G state, state that we, we were interested and of course with a proper parity measurement we could see that there is indeed um, entanglement in the sense that there is coherence between these two components it's a coherent superposition with a fidelity you know uh, um, uh, above 50 percent and so uh, it is achieving this uh, high level uh, high number of states entanglement high number of atoms entanglement now, as I mentioned before, and again very quickly, because you know I have I had to squeeze the scientific part of the talk into uh, 15 minutes to be able to talk to you about the flagship. Here is uh, another aspect in which we managed to achieve the quantum speed limit, so the fastest possible transformation of an atom put in a superpos coherent superposition of internal and uh, external states. How would it work? So this is a picture from the experiment from the lab of Andrea Bert in the group of Dieter Meschede in Bonn, in which they really were able to realize this um, uh, highly accurate state-dependent optical lattices in which you could displace uh, um, the lattice potential for a certain state, here depicted in red, from the lattice potential from a different state in blue, like 0 and 1, and therefore be able to not only perform a transport of the atoms over several lattice sites, but also to entangle them in the sense that uh, the atom would move depending, depending on the internal state. And so uh, here is the idea that, you know, the quantum speed limit is something which is known, the so-called quantum Brachy-Stockron, the smallest 
time uh, um, which you can in which you can perform this this transformation this is analytically known if you have overlap between if it is local you have overlap between initial and final state but essentially it is uh, um, impossible to calculate analytically if you really have vanishing overlap between the, the initial and final state so we were able and then you need to explore this shortest time the fastest um, transformation with the numerical methods in case you do not have this possibility to do it analytically and so with this very accurate uh, potential that they have we were able to create an optimal control pulse for transport of our atom and here is the result if you are entangling that now you are transporting as a function of the internal state so you will have the the uh, atom in the spin, uh, spin down state staying at the same place and the atom in the spin up state being moved away and then you you bring them back and you measure the with an interferometry sequence you measure the coherence of this operation and you see that this is possible to be done you know uh, down to a time scale which is of the order of magnitude of the harmonic oscillator time scale and the fidelity so the contrast expressed by the contrast in the interference fringe you know stays up to one essentially uh, uh, up, down until about this harmonic oscillator um, uh, potential uh, state and then this happens after you really have moved the atoms away from each other with zero overlap between the um, spatial wave function and then you can bring them back and this is something which you know it is possible in principle but you know precisely determining what is this uh, speed limit time which has not only fundamental interest but also technological interest because it, it means I can do my quantum operation of entanglement for instance in the shortest possible time is something where you can get an answer given my experimental system given my noise characteristics given my control electronics here what is the best that I can do in order to do this this experiment as quick as possible so this was admittedly a very short uh, uh, summary of some um, research activities in control but now let's come to the other dimension you know in a way this is just something which is building the building blocks for what we have really in quantum technology devices and so this is a part of a much bigger uh, uh, agenda let's say a much bigger vision which encompasses different applications and this is the strategic research agenda of the quantum flagship which we have elaborated with a broad consultation in the whole community and now through the involvement of the ukrainian physical society in the um, uh, quantum community network we can also have an involvement of ukrainian colleagues into the further elaboration of this strategic research agenda which we are now starting and which will be sort of performed over the next few months and so in this case at the moment we have these five application four application areas plus one uh, research area the research area of basic science which is seen as a scientific resource together with some technological resources to really underpin all the application areas of communication computing simulations sensing and metrology and this is the research part but now we are also moving towards the infrastructure part and i will come back to that speaking about your qci and your qcs in the next few slides so oh well okay so this is a slide which uh, i actually had planned to remove sorry for not having done that properly actually i thought that i had removed it oh i know i did it on my ipad and i'm presenting from my uh, from my computer i'm very sorry so let me skip this because this is something which all of you colleagues know about you know basic concept of quantum parallelism now the the point i wanted to make and you see this is a slide for a broader audience and for decision makers because one important point is look you know there are companies selling already these devices such as ibm in the us and google with the quantum supremacy experiment which they did now three years ago but as a consequence of our flagship we already have after the ramp up phase of the first three years we do have also european startups so for instance this is one example, but it is it is with Neutral Atoms, the company Pascal, which is a spin-off of the Pascal's project, but there are other companies such as IQM connected to the project OpenSuperQ with superconducting qubits and AQT uh, connected to the project uh, um, Axion, um, which is uh, 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 producing quantum computers with uh, um, uh, ion trap uh, qubits. So these are all you know, European companies which now start producing and selling such quantum simulators and quantum computers. And so what do we want to do with that? It is this infrastructure aspect that I mentioned before. We really want to make these machines available to the broader community, both of scientific users, but also of industrial users, in order to develop 
more and more applications to develop an application database and develop use cases comparing you know also the uh, performance for really useful problems beyond the academic uh, interesting problem of uh, google which uh, which was just used to demonstrate this so-called quantum supremacy but moving to quantum advantage so really having a quantum computer simulator outperforming a classical supercomputer uh, for a useful problem and so this is you know uh, implying also the embedding of these machines into uh, and connecting it as modules to classical supercomputers at supercomputing centers. We have a first pilot project, which is doing exactly this, with the uh, uh, French supercomputing center and the German supercomputing centers in Saclay and in Ulich with exactly this Pascal machine. And there is already uh, a call for a new um, edition sort of a new kind of uh, component of this infrastructure based not on quantum simulation but on quantum computing which is open now and will be evaluated in in the next future and this of course is something which should work for all the different uh, uh, platforms ions super semiconductors spin qubits photonic circuits neutral atoms and we want to combine all of this in order to sort of converge to bring this advantage to real users not only in the scientific community but also in the industrial community now again uh, i had removed this uh, but unfortunately i had not synchronized the presentation sorry this is just an illustration for the purpose of quantum communication of the way in which a simple quantum communication protocol works and again the relevant point here is that worldwide there are a lot of activities for instance here you see a depiction of the quantum communication point-to-point -point sequence of segments between Beijing and Shanghai, which is active since a couple of years, but also the uh, uh, quantum uh, communication satellite, which the Chinese government put in orbit. And again, you know, uh, our decision makers may start saying, oh, but uh, what about, you know, we are really missing out, we are missing the train uh, because everybody else is developing this technology and what, where is Europe? And in fact, Europe is also creating, so now it's established, it started with an informal meeting at our kickoff meeting of the flagship um, four years ago in Vienna. And now we have a quantum communication infrastructure which uh, involves all uh, EU member states and they are um, you know, uh, uh, engaged, they are uh, connected uh, into this big infrastructure which will work together to create this, uh, this, this kind of new, uh, uh, new possibilities. So, um, well, in this case, the idea is to combine terrestrial uh, channels and satellite channels to integrate quantum communication protocols into existing uh, secure communication systems for a series of purposes, protection of data, but also clock synchronization um, and others in order to create essentially a backbone, a, a, a basis and infrastructure for the future quantum internet. And here is, you know, I had the privilege uh, um, almost exactly one year ago at the G20 meeting of Ministers of Research and Innovation to present the first demonstration worldwide of a tripartite, so a quantum communication network between three, it was a point-to-point -point network without quantum repeaters, of course, but it was the first time that this was demonstrated at the same time between three different uh, um, uh, 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 nations. And these were three member states of the European Union. It was easy. Uh, it was made easier by the fact that we were sitting in Trieste, which is close uh, both to uh, Ljubljana in uh, in uh, in Slovenia and to uh, in uh, in um, Slovenia and to Rijeka in, in Croatia. And so we were able, fortunately, to demonstrate this with Italian technology. An example of the fact that we have technology available for this infrastructure, which is coming up in a lot of member states of the European Union. So, <clears throat> well, the broad vision then is expanding. So let me take the last five minutes to sort of sketch how it evolved from 2018 when we started this. We had some ideas beyond around the quantum flagship for what we could call the quantum fleet, let's say. And here the idea is that, of course, we have at the core those five basic fields, you know, science, which is connecting deeply with the, through the strategic research agenda to the framework program for research and innovation horizon Europe. And then we have the four application areas in which in every case we want to build the first quantum computer in Europe to create a pan-European secure quantum network and to achieve uh, sensing applications, for instance, for diagnostic and for navigation uh, and quantum simulation towards practical applications also in, the, in, the, uh, in chemistry and material science. And this is on the scientific side. But of course, you know, we really want also to bring, for instance, the 
quantum security and also the um, satellite navigation enhanced by quantum um, elements also to space and here is uh, uh, the space program of the European Union which is involved so not just research but also application and also there is a new program Digital Europe which deals with infrastructure in terms of cyber security and high performance computing here is this integration of you know quantum communication in EuroQCI the European quantum communication infrastructure at the level of standard communication um, security cyber security activities and also high performance computing euro hpc the Euro european joint undertaking for high performance computing in which we are going to build in the uh, aspects of uh, quantum computing and simulation with euro qcs the european quantum computing and simulation infrastructure there is also in digital europe program the aspect of advanced digital skills which connects with for instance Marie Curie programs and with the uh, important aspect of raising the next generation of um, quantum researchers which are needed to you know bring forward this progress and so also here there have been calls in, in digital Europe for programs for instance one for master pro, master's programs in uh, different fields and one consortium has been proposed for quantum technologies current under evaluation and of course you know member states are very deeply involved in this both in the sense of Quantera the um, uh, you know organization the Iranet consortium of now uh, almost 40 funding agencies from all member states and several associated states of the European Union and again here you know the involvement of all possible member states and all communities across Europe in a pan-European dimension is very crucial of course there is also some specialized organizations in terms for instance of the European Association of Metrology Organization Organization, Euromet, which of course again is very involved in the sensing and metrology part with all programs and also cooperating with the flagship, but also, you know, uh, in terms of the European Space Agency, which is of course, you know, an expression of member states acting in space in cooperation with the space program of the European Union. And of course, on the, uh, you know, horizon, there is also international cooperation. We had uh, different exchanges and workshops with Canada, uh, um, sorry, with the US and with Japan, and we already have with Canada one call which has been uh, um, uh, published last year and already the first projects have been selected and are going to uh, be active in this context. So this is the ideas that we had and here is a slide from the European Commission which shows that really these ideas are being now uh, deployed in the sense that we have this whole spectrum from the research-based you know ERC and quantum flagship based activities all the way which take place in the program horizon europe for research and innovation towards the program digital europe in which you know this advanced digital skills this master's programs that i mentioned before but also the infrastructure euro qci and euro qcs that i mentioned before and you know underpinning this in terms of innovation and possibility for our companies to really develop also new activities and entrepreneurial um, initiatives is the quantum technology fund which is being established with a cooperation between the European Investment Bank, the European Investment Fund, and the European Innovation Council. So this is creating a broader ecosystem of activities which you know, should lead to a, a, a commitment in which the European Union, not only in terms of research and innovation after the ramp-up phase, where we are now starting, starts the te technology demonstration phase and then the implementation phase, up until the end of Horizon Europe, but also the deployment and the Digital Europe program with this quantum simulator pilot, which I mentioned before, and now the first generation quantum computing deployment in high performance computers, which um, uh, is in this call, which uh, uh, open right now, which I, I mentioned before, but also in parallel on the quantum communication side, the Euro QCI first and then deployment phase in order to get a European quantum ecosystem, which is going to be supported again in Horizon Europe by specific calls for RTO research and technology organizations for open testing and experimentation facilities and pilot lines in order to really support this also in the context of the CHIPS Act. And then the Quantum Technology Fund is expected to start again soon in order to support business creation. So this is my final slide because my half an hour has come to an end in which I summarize all the components that we have. So what I already mentioned, the flagship at the core, funded by Horizon Europe, de developing research according to a strategic research agenda with the, in, in, in synergy with um, uh, member state programs. So I should mention that in the beginning, the idea was to have, you know, 1 billion euros for 10 years and half a billion would come from the 
European Commission and the other half a billion should come from uh, member state programs. But now this has increased to uh, the extent that the Commission is now investing in these different programs that I mentioned in excess of 2 billion euros and member state programs, including big programs in France, Germany, the Netherlands and others are totaling more than 5 billion. So that at the moment, the flagship has grown from the initially planned 1 billion to 7.5 billion and counting with the further initiatives which are coming over 10 years in order to really make it possible to deploy the research into infrastructure such as Digital Europe, EuroQCS and EuroQCI as I mentioned before and also supporting the private uh, entrepreneurship with the Quantum Technology Fund but also supporting the research from Quantera from member states and the industrial dimension is very important. In the last 30 seconds, I would like to mention that one of my projects in the last couple of years has been the creation of the Quantum Industry Consortium, which now came to uh, having 160 partners which are you know coming together from big and small industry in Europe to really create this quantum ecosystem and bring in the research that we as scientists are developing also to creation and commercial benefit. I think that my half an hour is now over, so I should conclude my presentation and stop the screen sharing so that I am ready to and happy to take some questions in case there are any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tommaso, for very interesting, very informative and exciting talk. Uh, the talk is open for discussion. Who wants to ask? Please, call Duke. Okay, I'm, I'm waiting for others, but uh, but uh, of course, uh, thank you for popular introduction and uh, the, the question. Uh, I, I have a question or, or two uh, to, to the first part. Uh, and uh, actually, it uh, could be standard question, uh, but, uh, but but the question is in this uh, continuous continuous quantum control. Uh, how what about then on pa quantum paradox? And I, I would expect that you should address it somehow. How is it, its its place in this uh, protocol? Uh, you mean uh, um, quantum paradox in the sense of the postulates of quantum mechanics as far as then a quantum paradox when when, uh, when you measure you when you measure when you when you introduce measurements uh, it, it is uh, you just uh, start from very beginning yes so well yes the fact is that these uh, control uh, protocols are uh, you know for um, optimizing the best outcome of, let's say, for instance, a state-to-state -state transfer or a certain process, so a quantum gate that we want to perform. So, uh, essentially, what we want to um, structure the continuous time dependence of our control functions in a way to get the best possible result. And so, this, I mean, all the measurement that we do and the feedback that we give, indeed, we restart from the beginning. So, the fact that you have collapse of the wave function, if you wish, you know, is not affecting us because, as a matter of fact, what you want is to see how good is the result, the final result. And then once I know how good it is, then I will start you know, adjusting my control to get a better result next time. But it is, you know, every time, it is not a closed loop, it is not fully quantum feedback. It is really kind of an iterative procedure in which the feedback on my system is classical, like I perform the quantum evolution, I measure, I collapse my, my system, then I get the information, how well did I perform, and I indeed restart. So in this sense, you know, since the goal is just to get a process with a certain quality for further applications, in this sense, there is no need after the measurement to, you know, uh, you know, really still use the system. And it is just, you can iterate in this way, and there is no problem in this sense with, with such quantum paradoxes. Mm -hmm. Because my impression was that you actually split the system and you measure a part of the system and then uh, just remain another part is in in uh, entangled state let's say no uh, no 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 uh, uh, well in principle you could do that if you would focus on a many body system and you just measure some part of it and maybe some entanglement could 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 remain but depending on the state of course because if it is a GSD state and I just measure one I mean the, the whole entanglement will collapse but as a matter of fact what we are interested in this control context is to get 
as much information as possible from the system in terms of the performance of the achieved goal. And so really it is not our interest to leave some entanglement residual, but the interest is, you know, extract all we can, ideally a full tomography of the system. In many cases, this is not possible. So we have to, 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 to work with just some partial information, but as much information we can get will be used then to iterate. So in this sense, uh, um, it is something which is really straightforward. It's more kind of engineering and it has little connection to say fundamental questions such as paradoxes in quantum mechanics. Okay, thank you. Okay. Maybe very short, uh, <laughs> just question about about this remote remote cooling, for example. Yeah, and uh, I, I wonder, and that of course uh, it uh, the time uh, it, it it depends on the the speed of the uh, line. Yeah, and time delay is crucial here. Uh, it should be. Yeah, how how you solve it? Uh, that, that's an excellent question and a very central one. As a matter of fact, uh, indeed, as you say, we want to be sure that. Uh, you know, after I do uh, uh, an iteration, an experiment, which takes, um, I know, maybe a half a second or something like this, or in some cases, a few minutes, if I have to collect some statistics, we want to be sure that, you know, for the next iteration, the experiment does not have to wait very long for the, uh, for the new pulse to, to be generated. And indeed, the, uh, uh, the sort of simplified procedure that we have with our CRAB algorithm is such that essentially the time for, you know, transmitting the uh, the result of the measurement you know generating the next pulse and retransmitting the next pulse to the experiment is really in the end negligible with respect to the cycle time of the experiment so this is really something which we achieve also via the high efficiency of the uh, optimization algorithm so that there is no delay like the experiment does not have to wait but essentially almost instantly gets back a new um, a new uh, pulse shape Okay, okay. The next question, Andrei Semyonov. Yes, thank you very much for a nice talk, Professor Klaka. Uh, I have such a question as from theoretician, very typical. Could you please mention about uh, mathematical tools or theoretical tools uh, which describe in this uh, procedure? So, because I'm impressed that uh, this is some uh, maybe open system, so this must be maybe master equation. And after that, with feedback. So this is uh, something like master equation or system master equations uh, involving this, uh, feedback, classical feedback, I mean, or just to mention how to describe it theoretically in general. Yes. yes. So now in, in case, of course, in case I, ha I have an experiment, I really don't need any theoretical description of model of my system. Oh. But I just plug the pulse, I get a result and I iterate. But of course, to prepare my pulse, I need the best possible theoretical methods which exist. For instance, if, if it is a Markovian uh, open system, then of course I will use a master equation. And if it is, for instance, a many body system, uh, which I need to simulate exactly, I will use tensor network methods uh, in order to, uh, to, um, uh, to describe in the most accurate possible way the dynamics, for instance, with time dependent uh, density matrix renormalization group methods in order to to uh, you know, mm, you know, reproduce the dynamics of of my system, or essentially, depending on what is the way, the accuracy with which I can model my system and calculate its uh, its uh, um, behavior, I can essentially take that and plug it into my 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 control loop. Now, there is also another aspect of mathematical methods which I just very very partially touched upon, so I'm very happy for for this question, which is also the kind of mathematical methods which are used then in terms of finding the minimum one. I have the figure of merit either calculated or measured. And so here I showed the simplex method Nelder Mead. This was implied in this figure, which I said, which is a little polytope in my landscape, like a triangle if it is dimensional, which then rolls down the landscape. But there are more sophisticated methods which are more sensitive to noise. For instance, if it is an open system, there will be noise. And so for for instance, we are now using some machine learning based methods such as CMAES, a covariant matrix adaptation evolutionary strategy, which essentially sends a little swarm of you know agents, if you wish, or a little swarm of, of uh, possibilities to probe your landscape and then tries to learn the curvature, the slope of my landscape, you know, out of that. And this is less sensitive to noise. So there is also there an entire zoo of algorithms 
not only for the simulation of systems, of quantum systems, but also for the minimization. And we are constantly improving on that. And this is part, indeed, even of a software package, which we are commercializing with a, a new startup company, which we, uh, which we have founded. And actually, you know, if there are, uh, you know, young, bright people which are interested in a job in, uh, in Germany, in a, in a startup in quantum technologies, we are currently hiring and we really need physicists which are interested in sort of collaborating on that. So this was my little ad, which I didn't do before, but now your question gave me the opportunity to do so. Thank you very much. Okay, we uh, uh, have to finish, but I want to ask uh, as a moderator, uh, after few, four years already of flagship, uh, can you say uh, in which areas of uh, quantum technology, uh, uh, it's, as I uh, understand, it's four uh, directions, this expectation come true, and in which areas is it necessary to revise the strategy? Uh, for example, uh, I see that uh, quantum computation is uh, not so effective and uh, in competition with quantum simulations, quantum simulations are preferable. Uh... So that, uh, that is a, a fantastic question and indeed among the most remarkable uh, uh, progress that we achieved is that uh, indeed in quantum simulation the demonstration of practical quantum advantage has been achieved. There is a nature perspective which is coming from um, uh, a few authors from one of our from our past quants project, one of our quantum simulation projects. You know, Emmanuel Bloch, Peter Zoller, and others. They have written this perspective really to show how uh, uh, and to describe what is the perspective after practical quantum advantage has been achieved in the context of the flagship. And this is really for some um, many body systems in which Emmanuel Bloch, for instance, realized the quantum simulation which cannot be reproduced by any classical supercomputer. So indeed, this practical quantum advantage has not yet been reached in uh, quantum computing, but yes, in quantum simulation. By the way, this is something which is not just the case for us here in Europe, but also in the US. You know, they have this quantum supremacy, but this is not practical quantum advantage, as I, as I mentioned. So does this lead us to revise the, 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 the goals? Well, yes, we are actually revising and updating the goals, but I could say that, you know, uh, uh, the expectations have been met because it was not the expectation to achieve quantum advantage in computing. In the research agenda, the expectation for quantum advantage in computing was farther away. So there is a, an important aspect of expectation management, which we fortunately did correctly in the research agenda. So the goals, the milestones for three years of the research agenda, we actually reached and overcame in some cases like quantum simulation, but also with quantum sensing. For instance, we have already first quantum sensors in space and also production of quantum sensing devices at the industrial level. So indeed, we are revising the roadmap and everybody is welcome to give input in the process in the next few months. But the expectations that we had have been fulfilled. And actually, the European Commission was very, very happy. And this was one of the motivations, a recent midterm review that we had for them to really decide to push even more strongly forward, because what we had promised in our research agenda has been achieved. So we are optimistic that this will be the case also for the future. And thank you very much this is because this is of course, also a question which is very close to my heart, next, of course, to the research aspects that we were discussing before. Okay. And the last uh, question from the chat, where can I read about your job offer? Uh, um, so the, the job offer, uh, we have, uh, uh, so the name of the startup is Cruise. Uh, I will write it in the chat. So the... Uh, so this is the name of our startup. You just Google it and uh, <coughs> um, we have a very new website and uh, you will find information there. And in case the information is not sufficient, you are welcome to email me, of course. And here I'm putting in the chat also my email address. Uh, actually, the... The startup email address for startup related questions and the um, institutional email address for um, you know, scientific related questions. Those are now in the chat and thank you very much for your interest. Okay, uh, so thank you very much again for a very interesting presentation, very interesting answers or questions. 
And uh, we have to move to the next talk.